So welcome everybody to session two of the UVM Extension New Farmer Projects Groundwork Program, linking mechanization to farm business planning. Our presenters today are John Hendrickson and also Jennifer Phillips. Both John and Jennifer uh, can tell you a little bit about themselves. They, they, I think they prefer to do a self-introduction. Uh, but for now, I'll just mention that John is joining us from the University of Wisconsin and Jennifer from New York's Hudson Valley. So a welcome to both of you. And I will pass it over to John. Hello, everyone. We've got a getting up to 36 degrees out here in Wisconsin today, which is uh, just really exciting given the polar vortex conditions that we've had. Thanks, Kristen, and it's a pleasure to talk to everyone today. Um, it's interesting. I do a lot of speaking to groups, and uh, maybe it's just because I don't do webinars as much, but I'm, I'm more nervous and anxious today than I am when I'm in front of a big group of people and they're staring at me. So, um, but I'm sure we'll, go, we'll get things going smoothly here. So uh, my name is John Hendrickson, and as Kristen said, I work at the University of Wisconsin specifically. I'm an educator and researcher at the Center for Integrated Agricultural Systems. We are a sustainable agriculture research and education unit. Uh, and actually, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. And so that's really exciting. I've been with the Center for actually most of those 25 years. I'm getting to be an old fart around here. Um, my appointment at the university is a nine-month academic year appointment, 75% time, which leaves me a very small sliver of my life to try to run my own farm. And so I am an organic vegetable grower at Stone Circle Farm, which is about 30 miles away from Madison, uh, quite small scale because I can't do too much in uh, the amount of time that I have away from my university work. Uh, we grow a lot of garlic, a lot of carrots, and a lot of hot peppers and are moving into doing year-round sales uh, through the wintertime with some of our root crops. And we sell mostly to restaurants. And so that's just a little tiny bit about my farm. I'd love to talk more about my farm, but I don't get to do that today. Uh, in terms of my university work, I do a lot of beginning grower training programs. Um, these feature two to three day intensive workshops. We have one on vegetable production, our market growers workshop. Um, Actually, the weekend after next, we have a cut flower workshop that we run uh, basically every other year. And then I also coordinate a school for beginning apple growers as well. And we're thinking about doing more schools moving forward because these are incredibly popular and there's an incredible amount of demand for them. Uh, just quickly here, I've got uh, a sketch of some of the types, types of work that I engage in. Um, do a lot of work on economics and record keeping and uh, labor issues on farms and marketing. And I've got scale uh, in bold there because uh, for me, uh, the scale issue is just really critical to uh, just about any topic uh, related to, to farming. I'm going to pause there and allow Jennifer to introduce herself. Thanks, John. Uh, I'll be brief here. So uh, thanks for inviting me today. I have been raising sheep and beef cattle here in the Hudson Valley for about 10 years. Uh, the uh, scale of my farm is moderately small. I, I raise about 50 ewes, sell about 100 lambs a year, and I sold my beef herd last year. Um, and I'm also a uh, have a the academic hat on, like John, I teach at the Center for Environmental Policy at Bard College. We run a graduate program, a master's program in environmental policy there, and my focus at the center is on uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change interactions with agriculture. So, uh, so my uh, contribution here today will just be to add a little bit now and then with some perspective on the livestock angle. So thanks, John. Go right ahead. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. I, I, we invited Jennifer to join me today because my work really focuses almost exclusively on vegetable production. And uh, while some of the information and, and ideas that I'm going to be sharing today are generalizable, I wanted to ensure that we had some perspectives and examples from the livestock side as well. Uh, 
just before I leave this slide, I'll just quickly mention this grower to grower report that's uh, the picture there on this slide. Um, this is a report I did a number of years ago looking at the economics at different scales of production on vegetable farms and really kind of forms the foundation uh, for the, a lot of the work that I've done since we published that back in, in 2005. Um, if you're interested in that report, it's a free download from uh, the Center for Integrated Ag Systems website. Okay, so scale. Uh, I really think that uh, this quote kind of says it, uh, sums it up for me, and this is a quote from the Market Farming Listserv that I subscribe to, and this is not a quote from me, but uh, I think the whole thing comes down to this. What is the right scale for my operation? The challenge is to find a size that represents a good fit for a grower's management skills. And of course, uh, there's a whole set of issues that are, that are wrapped up in that, in that scale issue. Uh, how much land you have uh, available to you, what your quality of life goals are, what your income needs are, uh, and maybe just as big a factor as the scale of your operation is your crop and market diversity. Uh, this is especially true on, on diversified vegetable farms where the level of diversity can be quite high and also uh, the amount of marketing, the different types of marketing engaged in can be quite high as well. And then that all, uh, the big issues that that settles down to uh, is how are you going to manage labor and what types of tools and equipment are you going to use on your farm. This is a rundown of the goals for today's session. I know that you all received this set of, of goals, so I'm not going to go over these one by one. Uh, you all received these as a, as a prelude to today's session. Um, this is my, uh, my goal for today is to, to run through most of these or all of these in, in some level of, of detail. Before we get started, I want to kind of put mechanization in context. And uh, a lot of this context, again, is going to be based on my experience uh, as a vegetable grower and working with vegetable growers. Especially in the early years of a farm's development, mechanization is, is most often linked to expansion. So a farm starts out real small, maybe with not a whole lot of tools and equipment. And then as they get bigger, uh, they find the need to acquire those tools and equipment in order to get the work accomplished in a, reasonable, in a reasonable fashion. So that expansion can be in acreage. It can be in herd size. It can also be in terms of the different markets and enterprises that a farm may engage in as they move forward with their farm operation. At the same time, as we're trying to mechanize, uh, we often have very little capitalization funds to do that. And uh, there are a lot of growers who are quite adverse to debt and risk. And so that uh, limits their, their available capitalization funds even more because many people uh, don't like to rush out to the bank and, and put themselves in that debt situation. The debt situation that most growers do find themselves in, uh, unless they've inherited land or uh, find themselves uh, in an incubator situation or what have you, is land costs. And this can really limit the amount of money that a grower has available to mechanize. And so what that usually does is puts them on kind of a long, slow process of mechanization over time. Um, there are very few growers that can kind of run out and buy that equipment package that they dream about all at once. Uh, oh, if we could do that. Uh, this is really obvious, but mechanization is very closely linked to labor. Uh, this is especially true on a diversified vegetable farm where there's just a lot of hand work. And a lot of that handwork takes a lot of time, and so payroll becomes a real significant issue. And uh, in some regards, mechanization is an attempt to try to try to hone in that uh, that labor cost, or at least make it more effective and more productive. It's important to recognize that mechanization purchases are not just about uh, you know getting some work done, but they're really investments in your business and they have a significant impact on a business's financial picture in terms of your net worth and um, your, uh, your, annual, your annual budget picture, financial picture for your farm. Another reality is that it is quite common for investments decisions to be made with very little financial analysis, and this can certainly lead to problems. Um, on, on real large-scale farms, uh, it can lead pretty quickly to real significant debt and, uh, and really nasty situations between your banker and, but uh, a lot of small farms can kind of keep this at bay because they, generally the equipment needed is 
not generally as expensive as a large-scale grain farm. I know a lot of farms that uh, just kind of jump in and, and get started without a business plan. I'm a firm believer that at least a, a simple basic business plan is a really important step to take. And an important section in a business plan should be your startup expenses and capitalization. So what tools are you going to need to run this business? What are those going to cost? And how are you going to pay for those? In order to estimate your needs and expenses accurately, I think it's really important to visit other farms, attend conferences and trade shows. And of course, these days, so much information is available online, and so you know you have the ubiquitous uh, uh, command to just just Google it and, and find out. Uh, it is actually a great research tool, the internet. In addition to figuring out, you know, deciding what kinds of equipment and tools you need, you need to figure out how you're going to pay for those uh, savings, family contributions, whether you're going to go get a loan. And in many cases, what's involved is reinvestment. Those first few years, uh, if you're able to make some money, you're usually plowing that money right back into the farm in terms of capitalizing and mechanizing. So this is something that I recommend that all farms start with. This is you know, basically an example of what you might include in your business plan in terms of that uh, the, that startup expenses and capitalization. You list the items that you're going to need. I think it's nice to have two columns in terms of cost. Uh, what's it going to cost new, you know, top of the line, or maybe uh, a, a lower cost alternative or used. And then also to include a cost to rent or hire, which is an option, especially as you get started. And then you might have a, com a column out to decide to make some notes or to give a different types of tools and equipment, a priority ranking as you move forward. One thing that I think is really helpful is to set up categories, which can help you plan more accurately and systematically. So for your farm, you can set up categories of things, uh, categories of tools and equipment that you're going to need so you can make sure that you're covering all your bases. For a vegetable farm, this might be a power source, you know, your tractor, or if you're farming with horses, it could be horses the tools that are going to be attached to that power source, and then you can break those down into different types of tools, tillage, cultivation, harvest, et cetera. And then it's really important to consider the post-harvest and delivery aspects as well on a vegetable farm. And those categories are going to be different based on the type of farm, the farm that you're, you're going to have. Uh, for a livestock farm, you might have different categories. Um, obviously, manure handling, you might be doing that on your vegetable farm, but for an animal farm, you're definitely going to be doing that. And then you're going to be looking to make hay and, and transporting animals around so that the categories might be different. So just a quick check-in to make sure that you all are paying attention and following along. This is one of these uh, multiple choice uh, questions that we are uh, ask you to weigh in on and uh, ask you all, what do you think it costs on a per acre basis to capitalize a vegetable farm in terms of equipment? And Kristen, if you want to jump in here, and, and uh, you probably can tell people how to choose multiple choice questions faster sure. than I Sure. So um, what I'm going to do is actually uh, make the poll. So polling type, how many questions, choices do we need, John? Four? Five. Five. All right. So thank you for your patience. So, so now you can go up to the polling box to the right of the smiley face icon and choose your answer, A, B, C, D, or E. And we'll give folks about a minute, and then I'll hit publish poll, and then we'll all be able to see uh, what the answers were. And uh, John, I'm not sure if you see Crystal's question where she says, wouldn't 5 be different per acre than 15 with the average cost per acre decreasing? As you're answering that, I'll hit publish poll. Sure, sure. Yeah, this is a this is a general uh, question, and things can certainly vary on a per acre basis. Uh, I've actually collected information up on this. Uh, some of it is contained in that grower to grower report that I found, 
And I actually found, while there's a, certainly a great deal of variation from scale to scale of farm, that uh, you look at a, a collection of farms and you look at enough farms and you actually find that it actually can be relatively even across farms of different scales. So um, we've got uh, some people that didn't vote, um, but we have people coming in uh, actually pretty evenly distributed across B, C, and D. And I'm going to go to my next slide here. And based on the information that I've gathered from farms, um, I've seen things in the range from ten to twenty thousand dollars per acre. And so I kind of use that as a as a general rule of thumb in terms of capitalization. And one thing to say here is it it certainly is going to vary whether we're talking about the initial price of the equipment or after you've got that on your farm what the resale value is going to be for that, that for that equipment. And also it obviously is going to uh, be impacted by whether we're going to include facilities. Um, for this exercise, I chose to exclude facilities. But I really have seen that even for you know small farms, um, two, three acres, uh, that this can be the case where growers are investing ten to twenty thousand dollars per acre in order to grow vegetables. We're going to I'm going to ask Jennifer to chime in here in terms of livestock here in a second. But before we leave this slide. Uh, just to give you uh, a snapshot of, of things that we might be looking at in terms of capitalizing a fresh market vegetable farm. We're going to need a set of facilities. Uh, we're likely going to need a greenhouse to grow transplants, perhaps as a, uh, as a place to grow crops as well in terms of hoop house production. You're going to need a place to wash and pack, and you're going to need a cooler. And then in terms of equipment, this is just a real brief sketch of some things that uh, might be an initial priority equipment list for, for a vegetable farm. Uh, there's a question here in terms of that, is that whether that's ten uh, to twenty thousand dollars invested annually. Now this is uh, this is your your equipment package that you have on your farm spread over your acreage and vegetables. If anybody has a question that I miss in the chat box, please alert me to that um, because I don't uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not looking at the chat box um, vigorously here. Yeah, so Jennifer, do you want to chime in here? I'm going to switch to the next slide here and um, have you weigh in on what it might cost to capitalize a, a livestock operation. Sure. Um, it's a little bit different. I think it depends so much on how many animals you're starting with because you, there's a lot you can get away with when you've only got a few animals to, to begin. But um, the two main things that I found I had to have under my own control were ability to brush hog my pastures because in most cases you're starting out with pastures that aren't in the kind of condition you need them to be in, especially if you're grass fed, you need pretty high quality pasture. And uh, if you're, if, unless you have a whole lot of animals to begin with and you can do some serious mob grazing where you're really concentrating animals, you really need to, to mow a lot in order to get your quality up. Um, so I, uh, I think you need some kind of a tractor to begin with. And then the other, the, the other part of the season that you need to think about with a tractor is that um, unless you've got less than, say, you know, 15 sheep or a couple of cows, you really need to be using round bales for winter feed as opposed to small square bales. And so you need to be able to move them. And so you have to have a tractor for that. Um, I, I, I know of a few small scale uh, sheep farmers around here that tried to start their operation without a tractor and it, they, uh, it didn't work very well. Um, but most, you, you listed a, a set of um, issues that a, a livestock farmer may face right in the beginning and that's handling manure, haymaking, and transport. And I think it will depend a lot on your, uh, your situation whether or not you, you might be able to be feeding, doing winter feeding on pasture so you really don't have a lot of manure handling to deal with. Um, I actually, my, I use a winter area but my uh, vegetable farmer neighbor across the road, um, he transports all my manure and spreads some of it for me and spreads the rest on his own fields every year. So I don't need any manure handling equipment. 
and hay making, I think until you get to a pretty sizable operation, um, in my perspective, it does not make sense to make your own hay and have hay making equipment. I purchased hay for the first nine years of my operation, and this past year was the first year I had hay made by somebody custom on my farm. And the advantage there is, of course, you don't have to deal with the labor of it. Um, and the hay that I was purchasing was um, better quality than I was able to have made on this farm because when you're hiring custom operators, of course, you're competing with everybody else they're trying to make hay for, so you don't necessarily get it done when you want. But purchasing hay, um, that hay had been stored indoors from a large-scale hay producer, so it's and he was delivering, you know, he would deliver to me once a week so I could store it inside my barn when he delivered round bales. So it's much better quality than what I could have had done on my own farm. Um, it costs more, but it's also a lot of labor that I don't have to put out if I'm purchasing all my hay or, or having somebody make it custom on my farm. And then transport, one of the big advantages of I don't have a truck, I don't have a stock trailer, and I, um, it's been a little bit of a challenge finding um, livestock haulers when I need them. But uh, one of the advantages there, because of running this farm by myself and not having anybody else to help, is if somebody else is there with a the truck, they're also helping load animals. So if I had to do that by myself, it, I would need to hire somebody to come and help me load each time. So there's there's definitely advantages to hiring um, custom, and and I think at my scale, you know, I'm sending animals every couple of weeks, maybe 20 lambs at a time. Uh, it's um, it, w it wouldn't pay for me to own and pay taxes and and insurance on a livestock trailer. So I think uh, there's definitely you made the point about scale being important. It's really critical that you think about how, how much you're really going to use that equipment, or if you can get somebody else to do it, there's a big advantage there. Um. Th thanks, Jennifer. I, I also did want to note that Erica sent in a question, I'm not sure if you and John saw it, uh, where she says fencing and watering infrastructure should be included in the startup capitalization too, right? Do you have yeah. anything to say to that? Well, I'll just note, I mean, I think from my perspective, we're, since we were focusing on uh, on uh, mechanization and tractors, I wasn't thinking too much about that. I, um, I'll i make one comment about fencing. Almost all of the fencing on my farm is portable, electric, and poly wire, so I don't have very much uh, uh, permanent fencing at all. Permanent fencing is super expensive, and especially when you're just starting up, you may not necessarily know exactly where you want those fences. So I, I, I think of fencing as something that over many, many years I might slowly start to put some permanent fences on this farm. But in water I use all um, the orchard tubing above ground, pretty inexpensive. I've got water in every paddock, but it was really inexpensive to put it in. So that was not a big cost for me. My tractor cost me a lot more than anything else cost me to get started, and I um, appreciate having it. I, I couldn't run this farm without a tractor. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, I, too, uh, I did not neglect uh, thinking about fencing and water. I was actually thinking about putting those in uh, the categories on that cost chart that I put up, but, but like, like Jennifer said, I, I chose not to do that given that the emphasis of this uh, webinar was on, on tractors and mechanization as opposed to some of those other uh, infrastructure costs. But clearly, clearly, if we're working with, with growers and particularly beginning growers, we need to be clear about the complete capitalization cost. Um, so point well taken. So thank you. So. Uh, a bit more about this mechanization planning. Um, it, when you're setting up that chart, uh, I said you should set up categories um, to make sure that you're c covering all your bases. Chances are you're probably not going to ever cover all your bases. There's always going to be something that you didn't anticipate. And so it's very smart to include a contingencies line item in your, in your business plan to account for the things that you just didn't think of. Um, you can get an idea from experienced growers, kind of what they think a good contingency budget might be. As a general rule, uh, I've heard that 
totaling up all of the things that you did think of and taking 20% of that is as, as, a, as a decent way to account for contingencies in terms of startup capitalization expenses on a farm. And then the other thing to, and you know, maybe this is my, my own ignorance showing through, but when I started my farm, I, and I didn't grow up on a farm, I came to farming from, uh, from suburbia. Um, I had this notion when I started my farm that if I, you know, once I got this tractor and this piece of equipment and that piece of equipment and I got my washing and packing shed set up that I was going to be done and then I was just going to be smooth sailing after that. And that grower to grower report that I did, which include farms that had been farming for 20, 30 or more years, I realized that a farm has never done capitalizing, that there's always uh, there's always a new tool, there's uh, a tractor breakdown, uh, there's a new roof that needs to be put on, um, et cetera. There's, there's, there, it's ne you're never done. And then the lastly, uh, you, if, if you deal with growers or if you're a grower yourself and you haven't done that business plan, it's never too late. Uh, it's never too late to sit down and, and write up a plan. Uh, in some ways it's easier after you get started because you know more than, than you did when, uh, than before you started. So it's really important to do a, a fair amount of research. Uh, this is a research project when you do a, do a business plan. And I've already said this, but I think the most important thing that growers can do, whether you're beginning or not, is to visit other farms. And I really like to, to ask lots and lots of questions when I visit a farm. Um, try to find out how many acres are in production or the herd or flock size, you know, what, how many different crops they're growing, how they're marketing. Um, Get, try to get a list of all their equipment and how much those things cost. Um, look around at the buildings, how are they used, what's the square footage, uh, how many workers, how many hours are being hired on the farm. And then what you can do with that level of data is to, to use that in terms of planning and projections. And what I like to do is think in terms of ratios. So, you know, what is the, the herd size per acre? Um, how much square feet of greenhouse space does this farm have in term per acre of, of vegetables in production? How many people are they hiring per acre? Those kinds of things can really help with planning. So in terms of scaling up, which is often associated with mechanization, uh, I, again, I, this is, some of these slides are based on the fact that I work with a lot of beginning growers and do a lot of beginning grower trainings. Uh, one thing that I really emphasize is that you can never be too small as a beginning farmer, but it's pretty easy to be too big. Um, and I also believe that slow, steady growth is generally less painful than rapid growth. And I've seen a, a tendency, certainly among vegetable growers, for unplanned growth. And what, what often happens on a vegetable farm is that when you're sitting in your greenhouse in, in March, it's really easy to, oh, I think I'll plant another flat of, of these tomatoes. Um, and it's really easy to uh, plant another flat or push that earthway cedar uh, another 100 feet or 200 feet. Uh, that part is easy. What comes afterwards, uh, if you weren't planning for that expansion, is not so easy. And some of the most sage advice that I ever heard in terms of expansion on a vegetable farm is that you should only expand, and this is especially true for organic vegetables, obviously, uh, only expand as your capacity to stay on top of weeds allows. And uh, if we don't follow that rule, you unfortunately end up with situations like this, uh, where I think that's some broccoli in there amidst the uh, can of thistle and who knows else, what else is in there. The, uh, the livestock equivalent, I guess, would be, you know, don't expand beyond the capacity of your pasture to, to handle that increased herd or flock size. Um, so, you know, don't expand beyond the carrying capacity of, of the land that you have. So when doing those critical growth steps as we expand, uh, good to expand in reasonable steady steps. Uh, I, I personally believe that it's good to, when you're expanding an acreage, to not take on significant new complex enterprises at the same time. So if you're, if you're deciding to go from, you know, from four to eight acres in vegetables, it may not be the best time to also plant an apple orchard on your farm or uh, suddenly decide to, you know, raise 200 uh, meat birds or something like that. Um, just try to keep your life a little sane by not expanding in more than one direction and more than one way at one time. And I like to follow the lead of my existing customers and markets rather than trying to do brand new things uh, with expanded production. 
And as we expand, of course, it usually means more employees and more equipment. I think these are some of the keys, I think, to settling the scale issue. And, you know, settling the scale issue is different from, from grower to grower. You know, that, that initial quote that I put was, you know, matching the scale of the farm to the management abilities and skills of the grower. Uh, the right scale for me might not be the right scale for my friend down the road. The keys to settling that issue, I, I'm a firm believer that we've got to do really good record keeping on farms in order to figure out what's working and what's not. Obviously we've got to uh, appropriately mechanize and that's what we're going to be talking about here through the rest of the presentation. Uh, I think it's really important to settle on, on the markets that work best for you. I know a lot of beginning growers that in the beginning try to do a lot of different types of marketing. They, they start doing farmers markets and they add a CSA and they start selling to restaurants and to the co-op and um, maybe do some UPIC and they're doing all kinds of different things. Most people find that over time they settle into some niches that work best for them and for their farm and for the markets that, uh, for the, the area that they're in. And then obviously we need to solve the, the labor puzzle. So just quickly on, on record keeping, because I think it's so important. This is not necessarily a, a mechanization topic, but I think it's really key in order to be able to mechanize effectively. Uh, we've got to have good information uh, in order to make decisions about mechanization. So we've got to track numbers on our farm. We've got to track sales for all our products and all our markets. I still run into people who sell at farmers markets and don't have any idea at the end of the year how much broccoli they sold versus tomatoes versus other things. And I, I'm just baffled by the fact that people aren't tracking their sales more accurately. On the other side, we've got to track expenses, uh, both production in terms of the marketing. And I think it's really important to track your labor, and especially given that we're, you're going to be using this information to make mechanization decisions and that's so tied into labor that I think it's really important to track labor on a farm and track labor by crop or by enterprise on your farm. And then we got to use that data to evaluate crops and enterprises thoroughly and honestly. Just briefly, we have developed a program called Veggie Compass here at the University of Wisconsin, which is a tool for whole farm profit management. It's a series of spreadsheets which enable Vegetable farms, and certainly other types of farms could use it as well, but it's mainly designed for a vegetable grower to track costs by crop and by market, and so to track profitability by crop and by market. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. Um, a Veggie Compass training is a whole day session in and of itself, but I wanted to alert you to the fact that this exists. Um, it's a series of Excel spreadsheets that are a free download from VeggieCompass.com, and I'd be happy to uh, visit with folks if they want to email me uh, afterwards and ask questions about Veggie Compass. So in terms of mechanizing for vegetables, uh, it's you know certainly quite possible to get started with, and this is a quote from a, a grower that I know quite well. She says, I got started with a, with a shovel, a rake, and a hoe, and you know, like $300 in the bank. And while that's certainly possible, uh, most growers will find over time that a, a whole range of tools and facilities are needed to, to grow and market effectively, profitably, and sustainably, particularly as you get older. That rake, shovel, and hoe uh, really start to become less appealing as you age and your knees and back start complaining. In terms of the livestock, I think actually it, it, there's some kind of big initial differences, and I certainly heard what Jennifer said in terms of uh, not needing to necessarily invest in haymaking equipment from the get-go, but you know, unlike vegetables, um, there are some things that you, you kind of just need to do on an animal farm that you're probably just not going to do by hand on an animal farm. So you, know, you can grow a lot of vegetables and generate a lot of gross income with very little tools and equipment in terms of vegetables. So you can do things by hand. You can transplant by hand. You can weed by hand. You can harvest by hand. You can wash by hand. You can do all these things by hand. Um, when it comes to livestock, you got some changes, some differences here. Where you know, if you've got any amount of animals, you're probably not going to want to handle that manure by hand. Uh, you're going to want a skid loader and uh, a manure spreader. And certainly, uh, in terms of the pasture that Jennifer mentioned, you're going to need a way to maintain your pastures. 
even you know even if your pastures are in really good shape down the row down the down the line you're going to need to mow the borders and and things like that so having a means to do that is just virtually uh, necessary from the get-go whereas you can you know you can grow start you can start growing vegetables without a tractor and the other thing that's very true in terms of livestock is that you may find it easier and common to having an alternative to buying equipment as Jennifer mentioned she buys her hay in and you know she's mentioned that she mentioned that it's more expensive I actually I'm not so sure my guess is it is probably far less expensive it may seem expensive when she's paying that price for hay made for her but in terms of owning the equipment and the labor cost of producing that hay yourself and having that equipment being idle for a good portion of the year chances are more often than not that it's going to be far more economical to custom hire or or buy buy that hay rather than make it yourself so just some general mechanization advice and uh, this first one is probably more directed at myself this is the problem that I combat on my own farm is being just wishy-washy and not being uh, being afraid to uh, to invest and kind of just spending uh, endless hours uh, analyzing things and, and shopping and comparing alternatives and uh, getting stuck in this paralysis by analysis phase um, it's going to cost money to run a farm you're going to have to you're going to have to invest in your business and you've got to be ready to do that I think it's actually important to go through a period where you don't rush out and do a lot of those purchases uh, especially for a beginning farmer that maybe didn't grow up on a farm to make sure that farming is going to be right for you so I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea to, to have a little bit of wishy-washiness in the, in, in the beginning and, and wait to make sure that this quality of life and, and the finances are, are likely to work out before you start investing in tools and a lot of vegetable growers that I talk to uh, report that the equipment pays for itself quite quickly on a vegetable farm uh, this is especially true uh, for you know intensive high value production because you're able to generate quite a bit of income on a per acre basis and so a cultivating tool or a transplanter uh, can pay for itself quite quickly in terms of reducing labor costs and getting labor done more efficiently and just a, a couple other points uh, on here I had this on the, on the bottom if it doesn't work sell it I, I, I visit a lot of vegetable farms where they've you know obviously acquired a lot of tools and equipment over time and a lot of them are just kind of sitting around in the weeds and, and not um, you know kind of it would definitely fall in the unproductive asset category um, if your banker came out and visited your farm and uh, some good advice I, I know I have, a, I have a grower friend up in northern Wisconsin and he's really good about you know if something doesn't work for his farm or in his operation he tries it for a little while and if it doesn't work he sells it he doesn't hold on to it and, and have it sit there in the weeds another point there is that it can take multiple years to kind of fully integrate a new piece of equipment or machine on your farm um, it takes a little to a while to tweak that cultivator and get it set up or to train your yourself or your workers to use a tool um, to its maximum of effectiveness so uh, that's something to keep in mind uh, whether you're a grower or whether you're advising growers is that it can take time you know, the, the tool doesn't necessarily just waltz into your farm and start working perfectly from day one So in terms of setting goals, priorities, and decisions, uh, you know, it comes back to the, the goals for your business and setting those, writing those down, and this includes economic and quality of life goals for your, for your farm. Again, I think it's really important to visit other farms and talk to other growers as you're setting goals and priorities and making decisions. And another really good piece of advice is that when you're considering buying a piece of equipment, is to, to get some references from the person that you're buying it from so you can talk to people that have used it and, and used it more than one season um, it's a really really good advice and then there's a set of questions to ask uh, you know do you really need to own it can you can you rent this piece of equipment at least in the beginning maybe it's not a long-term solution but maybe it's a solution temporarily or can you custom hire the work can you lease it uh, with an option to buy or can you trade and barter for that piece of equipment in order to accurately determine whether it makes sense to buy something rather than rent or custom hire 
and it's important to consider the true cost of ownership. And that's, you know, that's beyond just the purchase price. On an annual basis, you've got depreciation, um, you've got interest if you borrowed money to buy that piece of equipment. You may have major repairs. Uh, you're certainly going to have maintenance. Uh, you may have insurance if it's a building. It's going to cost labor to use that piece of equipment. Obviously, if it's a tractor, uh, it's going to eat fuel and oil. And then for, especially for buildings, uh, you may have taxes on that, on that asset. So you should estimate all those total costs of ownership on an annual basis. And then you should divide those annual costs over an increment that makes sense in terms of a comparison. So say for a building, or if you're going to put up a building where, and you need to compare the costs in terms of renting a building, that might be on a monthly basis. So you divide that annual cost by 12 and try to figure out whether it makes sense or not. In terms of a tractor, it might be an hourly basis if that's what your equipment dealer is going to charge you on an hourly basis to rent a tractor. In terms of field equipment, uh, in terms of comparing with customer hire, it might be on a per acre basis. So the cost of owning that haymaking equipment versus the, the per acre cost that uh, the custom operator is going to charge you to come in and harvest that hay for you. And you need to be honest about those costs. And then it's equally important to not just look at those numbers, but really f figure out whether it's practical and economical to do the rent or custom hire. Is, you know, can you even rent, uh, can you rent a water wheel transplanter in your, in your area, in your area if you're a vegetable grower? Probably not. Um, and this is where it, it, there's a lot more options in terms of livestock uh, production and grain production in terms of being able to rent equipment. A lot of uh, vegetable equipment is quite specialized and not available, not available to rent. Some, some, uh, some exceptions to that is you might be able to have a neighbor uh, chisel plow for you. So more about goals, priorities, and decisions. So before you go out and buy, uh, these are some questions that I think you should ask yourself or if you are an extension person uh, working with growers, these are some questions that you could ask them or encourage them to ask themselves. Does it fit within the context of your farm plan? Does it fit your scale? And maybe even and more importantly, does it fit the scale that you want to reach? What does it cost? What does it cost to operate? What is its resale value? And here's something that's actually quite uh, on, on the advantage side in terms of vegetable production is that a lot of vegetable equipment uh, doesn't lose or uh, doesn't lose its value very, very much uh, because a lot of vegetable equipment is in high demand. Uh, you know, a great example of that is the Alice Chalmers Model G tractor. If you find one of those and keep it in good condition, uh, chances are you're probably going to be able to sell it perhaps for more than you bought it for. Is it durable? Can you repair it yourself? Is it easy to use? Is it enjoyable to use? Can other people on your farm use it? I've got a tractor on my farm that I'm basically the only person that can push the clutch in all the way because it's an old tractor and my five foot uh, wife and my uh, less than full grown sons can't push the, uh, the clutch in all the way. So they can't, they can't operate that tractor. Uh, is it sustainable? If that's uh, important for you, and I think it should be. And finally, do you need it or do you want it? And I think you need to be honest and, and thoughtful as you're uh, thinking about buying a new piece of equipment about whether you, whether you really need it or want it. And also to really pay attention about whether you're focusing in on, on the honest weak links in your production system or whether you're kind of defaulting to a, oh, I need to buy something in, uh, in order to cure, in order to make things better on my farm. Uh, there's a there's sometimes there's a rush to, to, to cure, you know, if you're not happy with your farm, you're not happy with it, you know, the quality of life or the economics, well, I'll just go out and buy, buy something. You know, I'll buy myself a new tractor and make my life better. And that's a dangerous uh, treadmill to, to find yourself on. So uh, here's another uh, question to, for you all to weigh in on. Let's say we're a new grower and we're just starting out, so we've got an acre and perhaps less in vegetables and we've got limited capitalization funds. And we, we, need, we feel like we just need so many different things to on our farm. Uh, and here's four. Uh, we need a greenhouse. Uh, we feel like we need a tractor. Uh, we need a cold storage unit. And we, we need a way to get our produce to market. Where should, how should we prioritize amongst these four big needs? 
as we're just starting our on our starting our farm. So can we set up a can we set up a poll? We sure can set up a poll. So we I'm going to polling type A B C D and people will give folks about a minute to choose one and then we'll publish it. So which one? A, B, C, or D? Give folks about five more seconds and then we'll publish it. Once it's published, it doesn't add your responses, so that's why I wait. Okay, here we go. Publishing responses. Here we go. Okay, interesting. Well, you guys fell for my trap. <laughs> this is my anyway, my bias and in, uh, in talking with a lot of vegetable growers over the years. The the thing that I think growers should should buy first is the cold storage unit. And that's because on a vegetable farm you're dealing with perishable product. And uh, fresh picked or picked just this morning is really not, uh, really doesn't cut it on a fresh market vegetable farm. And let me just run down some of these other things. Um, green, a greenhouse. Uh, you can actually get started on, uh, on a very small scale growing plants inside. Or an even better option is to contract with a nearby farm and have them grow them grow uh, your trans your transplants for you. Uh, you can you can get a lot done with a rototiller in the beginning years, or if you really need to do tractor work, you can uh, have someone do that for you. And I've found uh, I grow uh, an acre or two of vegetables, and I've actually been able to do. Uh, quite a bit of delivery and a Pontiac vibe. Um, so a delivery vehicle, you can usually get away with you know, a vehicle you have on hand, um, but there's not many options in terms of being able to keep produce cold. Um, what I did on my farm my very first year when I knew I didn't have cold storage is that my very first year I grew winter squash, onions, and potatoes, which don't require cold storage. So you know, there's some ways around that. But I personally believe that the cold storage unit is absolutely the most important, um, most important piece of equipment on a fresh produce farm. You know, if you're going to be a mail carrier, uh, you've got to have a delivery vehicle. There's just some fundamental things, and I think in order to be an effective and profitable vegetable grower, you've got to be able to have store your product and deliver it fresh and in high quality. So that's my bias. Um, other people might argue with me. Uh, if somebody's asking with the passenger seat taken out uh, for, on my Pontiac Vibe, no, I, I'm, the passenger seat is in. I just uh, stuff it. I've, I've been able to get an entire uh, five foot, six foot high pallet of produce into my Pontiac Vibe. So uh, generally, target areas of mechanization um, are you mechanize those areas that are demanding the most labor and are the most physically demanding. And I've got a grower friend who says, you know, this is driving me nuts is a great motivator for where, where, where and when you need to capitalize. So for the vegetable growers, and I'm going to give uh, Jennifer a chance to weigh in on, on this uh, as well in here in a few slides, but I really like to emphasize for vegetable growers the back end of your farm. And I've already given away some of my, some of my thunder here in terms of that question before. But I break, the, I break the vegetable farm down into, into the front, the middle, and the back. And the front end of the vegetable farm is, with, uh, is where you're producing uh, transplants, planting seeds. It's your, you know, it's your tractor in terms of your horsepower, what's driving your farm in terms of power, uh, those primary tillage tools. That's the front end of the farm. The middle of the farm is taking care of weeds, irrigating, doing insect and disease management. And this is where I fit in fertility and cover crop management as well, as you could argue that that maybe is the, the front end of your farm as well. Um, I put it in here. And then the back end of your farm is harvest, post-harvest, storage, market sales, and delivery. And I think it's important for farms to emphasize the back end of their farm in the beginning. 
Um, and uh, John, I'm just going to interject here as we had said I would be a little bit of a timekeeper here, just letting you know we've got seven minutes. Okay, great. So especially with our food safety regulations coming, uh, I think we need to emphasize the back end of our farms. Uh, I tell this all the time that we can need to avoid the picnic table approach to washing and packing on our farms. Um, it's just not, not advisable. We need to have a covered area with washable tables and sinks. So here's a, here's a better example. And then even better is enclosed and having some uh, efficient tools like wash lines to, to wash vegetables. So switching to a livestock perspective, um, I, I, this is m one of my best friends as an organic beef farmer here in, in Wisconsin. And I've already kind of gone over most of this uh, in terms of the message. Um, but with, with animal production, your outstanding cost is feed. And if you look at the feed cost, that's driven by land, the cost of fertility, and the cost of the equipment to, to produce that feed. And you know, we're looking at a very different picture in terms of income per acre. And so land becomes a huge factor in terms of, in terms of raising, raising animals. So these pinch points are land and equipment. Uh, if you've got lots of land, great. If you don't, long-term rental agreements are a great option in terms of being able to have the land needed to raise, to raise animals. In terms of equipment, custom operators and, and rather than owning. Uh, my friend is he's an economist and he's run endless numbers on on the cost of, of raising animals. And it almost always a full cost analysis will almost always show you that having that, that haymaking equipment uh, doesn't pay. You know, it pays to have a customer operator. So I'm going to leave it there and I apologize to Jennifer for not giving her much time uh, to weigh in. Hopefully we'll leave some time at the end for her to, to weigh in a little bit more. Labor, biggest factor on a fresh market vegetable farm. And so you've got to, and I, I really like to think about maximizing the impact of labor rather than trying to cut labor costs. Um, I think it's more, more effective and uh, proactive to think about how to maximize the impact of your labor and the impact of your, of your work crews. Anybody have any idea how much, uh, maybe we won't do the full poll on this uh, to save time, uh, but what percent of gross income on an annual basis goes to payroll on a vegetable farm? This may be the easiest question of the, the, the three that I asked. My, I don't, I don't have the answer here on the next slide, but it's typically in that 20 to 40 percent range. Uh, quite often, 25, 30 percent of, of a farm's payroll or uh, annual gross income goes to payroll. I really like to tell farms to develop, try to develop efficient systems on their farms before hiring workers. It's one thing to do something in an efficient manner yourself. It's another thing to step aside and pay someone else to do that job inefficiently. Um, so it really pays to be organized and develop systems on your farm. It really pays to be careful about who you hire and develop uh, set expectations, set work rates and target times for tasks. And getting back to that weed, the weed thing, don't expand your farm uh, unless you can manage the weeds. Nothing slows down labor on a vegetable farm, especially in terms of harvest, um, like having to look for the crop um, if your weeds are out of, out of control. And finally, I think it's really important to invest in tools and facilities to make that harvest and post-harvest handling more efficient because harvest and post-harvest is going to where the majority of the labor is going to be on a vegetable farm. And so if you can invest in tools and equipment to make that more efficient, you're, you're, going, to, you're going to be ahead in the game. So again, maximize the impact of your hired labor. And finally, trying to find that right scale. Uh, again, visit other farms, set goals, keep records, use those records to evaluate your farm and make informed decisions. Don't be afraid to invest in your farm. Again, most, especially on a vegetable farm, most of the equipment is going to pay, pay for itself in terms of making your farm more efficient, improving your quality of life. And don't be afraid to make changes. If something's not working, uh, you, can, you can change it. Uh, if wholesale markets aren't, being, aren't profitable compared to your direct markets, drop the wholesale, or vice versa. And that's a dynamic process. You need to constantly reevaluate your goals, your challenges, and your strategy each year. 
And just real quick, uh, this is what this is what I call the reality curve. This is uh, something I show my the beginning growers that I work with, and um, in the grower schools that I enter, is that we often begin our farms with a phase of naive enthusiasm, which carries us to a certain point, and then unfortunately we usually hit something that I like to call the rude awakening, which plummets us to the pit of despair. And hopefully we can come out of that, uh, get on track, and have that breakthrough. And the unfortunate reality on, on most farms is that this is not just a one-time reality curve. This happens on a, on a yearly basis, or a weekly basis, or even multiple times on a daily basis uh, on our farms. A few quotes to, I'm not going to spend time discussing these. This is more thought pieces for you all to carry forward with uh, moving forward. Uh, the one I want to highlight is this first one. And this is a quote from the Market Farming Listserv again that I started with. Um, grower believes that a profitable farm operates at about 75% of the capacity of their invested resources, their equipment, their hired labor, and their land. Below that, and you're probably going to be buried in overhead. Above that, and you're probably pushing your, your resources um, too hard, and you're going to lack, um, lack some flexibility. A few ideas on some resources for you all moving forward. I'm not going to read through those. Uh, these are some of my favorite resources to think about tools and equipment. And um, we'll end there with uh, appreciate your feedback and my contact information. Great. John, I really want to thank you. Jennifer, I want to thank you. Um, and I also wanted to let folks know that uh, these resources and other resources will soon be available on our Groundwork website, which is just about uh, to come live. Beth has been working hard on that. Uh, and then just wanted to encourage everybody to please uh, do fill out the post-session evaluation. We take your feedback, but really take it into account in trying to develop a good program for folks. So thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you, everybody. Oh, Beth said, what's coming up in March? Um, we thank you. February 13th, we have Rich, Rich, uh, Richard, uh, we have Wiz coming up, right? Richard Wiswell, who is going to be doing our second uh, mechanization uh, uh, webinar, really focusing on what equipment you might want to focus on and looking more closely at the specific types of equipment. Again, focusing uh, largely on cultivation equipment, uh, veggie production, but <coughs> certainly with livestock information as well. Uh, David Noel, we will. Uh, I'll send out everybody uh, contact information for Jennifer. Make sure that we use. We're using the uh, contact information she wants us to use. Or Jennifer, you could put that in. Right